The Unshackled Waves, episode 34. Hello and welcome to the Unshackled Waves podcast. I'm Tim Wilms, here for this week's review episode. I am once again joined this week by my co-editor-in-chief of The Unshackled, Sukath Fernando. Welcome back. Thanks, Tim, and hello, everyone. So over the past weekend, we saw the annual Sydney Gay and Lesbian Mardi Gras parade through Oxford Street in Sydney. The Unshackled published a very triggering article calling for it to be banned from the public, as, after all, it's a hypersexualized, indecent event. And we are also now three days out from the Western Australian election, for which The Unshackled will be hosting a special live stream on Saturday night. We have just published our comprehensive election preview for our readers. The focus of Australian politics for this week is solely on the West and what the result will mean for federal politics. Now, before uh, we, we start the topics, uh, if you're watching this podcast on YouTube, you will notice a new white backdrop behind me. So once again, we are taking another step up in our production quality. For those who have watched uh, previous episodes, you will know that I do them in my bedroom. I do this for sound quality purposes, as I'm sure you don't want uh, any background noise. So now with this backdrop, you have no idea where I actually am. So I wanted to actually sh- showcase uh, this uh, last last week's podcast, but unfortunately we couldn't get the, the video version of the podcast that week because Arthur had to phone in rather than use Skype. But it's here this week, so yep, uh, hopefully you all enjoy it. All right, so for our first topic and uh, trigger warning, this is going to be uh, discussing some controversial matters but if you're a listener to uh this podcast you you really shouldn't need a trigger warning i suppose you don't because you know you expect triggering from this podcast anyway i mean i suppose you welcome triggering so Mm. it's a good surprise i think Uh, maybe we might get someone email say i'm triggered (laughs) <laughs> That's a compliment. Yeah. So this is a, this topic is we published an article saying that the the Mardi Gras should be uh, banned, which uh, it got a it gained a lot of traction online. There was a lot of people that agreed with it, a lot of people that uh, dis- disagreed with it. Yeah, I mean there were. I mean most people did agree with everything it said. Um, there were some who did comment things saying that they they liked it, they supported it, um, but you know most of our audience is against the Mardi Gras and we know that and that's what and that's who the um, actual article was aimed at so you know yeah if you look at the event objectively I mean it's a highly hypersexualized event I mean you know there's uh, there, there's floats in the parade dedicated to sexual fetishes there's uh, there's men not wearing you know much clothing simulating sex during during the parade I mean it it's pretty pretty vulgar and uh, you know, so it's fair to ask the questions, how come this is allowed in public when on any normal day it wouldn't be allowed? I mean, why should our decency laws be suspended for, for one night? Yeah, that's one major sort of um, topic that people are talking about. Why is the Mardi Gras and its performances, why are they allowed to actually carry them out on this particular day and then every other day of the year it's all banned, it's all um, um, ban under the decency laws. So the thing is, that's the actual sort of crux of the argument, because you know, this particular night it's allowed, but then for the rest of the year it's not allowed. Um, and the thing is, that's why we are asking why does it happen in the first place. That's why we called for a ban of the Mardi Gras, because common sense would tell us that it should be banned um, according to our decency laws, but not be allowed on a particular day of the year. Well, the reason why it is allowed in public is because it's it's a parade a parade dedicated to a designated designated victim group, the LGBT community. So, because they were oppressed in the past, then apparently that makes their behaviour today okay. That's the logic, it seems. Yeah, that's the excuse, and that's a very bad excuse because that doesn't 
legitimize their sexually lewd and you know deviant performances um because ultimately it doesn't matter it just i know it's these are sensitive um topics i get that we get that we mentioned that in the article but the thing is just because you, people were oppressed in the past it doesn't mean that you can flaunt your degeneracy in front of children in front of infants in public that's the whole different thing okay i mean it's one thing to ask for uh, i suppose equal opportunity laws that's what that's one thing but it's another thing to say that you know we were oppressed and now as uh, in as a, as a result we, we now want this uh, we want to be allowed to flaunt our sexuality to the whole entire world it doesn't make sense yeah and we proposed a solution to to this to to this problem, which was that the parade, uh, if it doesn't, if it doesn't clean up its act, the parade, then it should be moved to a private stadium and restricted to those over 18, or it can, you know, clean up its act and still be allowed in public, which I doubt they would do. But if they continue to, you know, basically, uh, you know, car uh, carry on this parade in the manner it is in public, then the police should really, you know, actually enforce the law. They should, because every other day of the year they enforce the law. I mean, for 364 days of the year, they do enforce the law. It's just on this particular day, they don't enforce the law. So, yes, I think the police should actually, you know, make sure that uh, such lewd performances aren't allowed, that such lewd performances don't even, aren't even conducted in the first place. Um, but I think um, the solution to move it to a private stadium is quite a good solution, because, you know, it, um, because... For this day and age, sometimes you know banning it might be a bit too extreme. You know, it might be a, a regressive um, sort of decision as well because uh, banning it might result in an even worse impact. Um, so maybe moving it to a stadium. I mean, the the LGBT community, the the snowflakes, the, the cultural Marxists, they won't like it. Even even the stadium solution, they won't like it because even that will be homophobic. Yeah. Yeah, they want they want the only thing they want is to do, keep doing what they're doing right now. Um, anything other than that is or anything more anything a tad more restrictive is homophobic. Um, but you know that, that's that's just too bad. You know I think the stadium solution is a good solution. It's not as ideal as completely banning it, but you know it's a good start. It's a good step in the right direction. Uh, uh, there, there's no uh, observance that you know th this parade uh, go goes too far. I mean, yeah, like we said, just because you were oppressed in the past doesn't mean you get to carry on in any way way that you want. Uh, I mean, uh, just looking at this objectively, it's yeah. Why why is this allowed? Like I use uh, like I use the analogy, and this was mentioned in the article that imagine if a bunch of straight men decided to celebrate their attraction to women and had a parade down the middle of Sydney with girls in bikini. Like, can you imagine the outrage from the the feminists who'd say it's objectifying uh, women, uh, or it's pro uh, they'd say it's promoting you know domestic violence. They'd they'd be outraged about it. They will be. It's 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 um the same as you know white people being proud of their own race. Um, it's it'll be seen as it, it the straight parade, the heterosexual parade itself will be seen as homophobic. You know, just like how white pride is seen as racist or, or you know something against blacks. Um, but yeah. That, that's the irony. Ultimately, that's the irony because you know they don't have a problem with these performances, but they will have a problem with heterosexuals celebrating their sexuality. So you know, that's ultimately the the inconsistency we, we see in the left all the time. And I'm, I'm not saying we need to have a heterosexual pride parade. We don't. That would that would be quite bad as well because you know children will still be there. What, I'm, what we're saying is you know it's ironic. Yeah, oh, well, considering the, the fact that, you know, uh, uh, men are accused whenever they have um, sex with, like, there's feminists out there who believe that uh, every time a man has sex with a woman, it's rape. I mean, you know, heterosexual intercourse is starting to be, be demonised. So sort of, I can sort of see a bit of the logic of, you know, men reaffirming their attraction to women since it is so demonised today. Uh, it was pointed out, it pointed out to me in one of the comments to the article that, 
uh, Summer Nats uh, celebrates uh, men's attraction to wi uh, to women. Uh, why don't you complain about that? But the thing is that Summer Nats, this is an out out outdoors festival. It's uh, it's held in a private exhibition park, so it's not it's not in public like the Mardi Gras is. If if it did spill spill out onto the street, uh, Summer Nats, I would also be advocating for for them to make sure that they keep it inside and not not expose the public to this behavior yeah exactly you know if they do the same thing and parrot it in public then even that should be banned in public as well i mean what they're doing right now is the responsible choice they've taken the responsible choice by restricting their behavior to a private arena or a private environment instead of you know i mean it is normal i suppose uh, it's the it's the natural order what they're celebrating um but the thing is uh you know again, it's still sexual and you can't have it in public, even though it is, I suppose, the natural way, um, et cetera. But, you know, yeah. And most Australians don't care if someone is LGBT. Uh, God, it's, it's such a complicated acronym to say. Yeah, most people don't care. I mean, people, the thing is, people confuse the opposition to the Mardi Gras as homophobia. That's not, they're not the same thing, okay? People oppose the Mardi Gras, not because, not really because, you know, it's based on LGBT people, it's because it's flaunting sexuality in public, okay, yeah. it's, it means children are exposed to it, same, I mean, as we said earlier, if it was a, if it was a heterosexual festival, again, we would be advocating for it to be banned in public, because even that would be, um, I suppose, flaunting sec your sexuality, and, you know, children will be seeing all these sexual performances, no matter what. Um, so, you know, just because you oppose the Mardi Gras, it doesn't mean you're homophobic. We have homosexuals who actually do oppose the, the Mardi Gras. And, you know, we have people like Mali Yiannopoulos who are against the LGBT agenda. So, you know, it's nothing to do with homophobia. Yeah, and and also the, the fact that, you know, most people are straight and you know, don't don't particularly want you know homosexual sexual acts you know shoved in their faces. I mean, respect is a two way two way street. I mean, yes, people should respect that you're gay, but they should also, but they uh, gay people should also respect the fact that most people are straight and you know don't want it you know shoved in their faces in public. Yeah, they they should. That's another important thing. You know, they shouldn't they should they should be respected after all. I'm not, you know they shouldn't be beaten up or anything they you know you shouldn't even be illegal what, what we're saying is again you shouldn't you should know your limits you know you should know your boundaries you know you can't just shove your you know, force your sexuality into the, upon other people and you know just ask for more for more acceptance and for more respect when you know the thing is your act itself is an act of disrespect uh, 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 not wanting to see, you know, homosexual relations, that's not homophobic, that's just your sexual preference. Yeah, it is. I mean, I, I, ultimately it is. I mean, homophobia is, it's like defining racism, isn't it? I mean, people have sort of broadened everything to include, to be included in this definition, when the thing is, in reality, the definition doesn't actually take up a very broad, um, area of topics it's, it's a specific definition and people have expanded it purposely to include you know every every anti-gay or what they think is anti-gay thing to be included in homophobia and i think really that the lgbt lobby they're really pushing things too far i guess with you know shoving things in people's faces and i reckon it's going to promote uh result in a huge backlash against them because people most australians is you know pretty much i don't give a stuff what you do you know australians have a let, live and let live attitude but if they see these people carrying on with a sense of entitlement you know constantly saying you know they're they're bigoted then they're, they're going to their, their support for you know gay people is going to go down yeah it's again that's why we call them the regressive left isn't it because you know ultimately they want to do something but then it's going to end up making things worse for them you know, they want they want to see more acceptance, but then they're gonna act like you know degenerates in public, and that's just gonna result in people hating them even more. Um, you know, you bring it up on yourself, really. Yeah, 
And also, uh, I copped criticism from some libertarians because of this article, because, because it's like, oh, ha this is a form of, you know, censorship. Oh, you know, how can you be in favour of banning it? Well, we said that it should just be banned from public, because libertarians seem to forget that the public space is a shared space, and surely in a public space, we should have a set of rules to make sure that there's decent behaviour. I mean, yeah. yeah, I mean, libertarians, yes, like nobody should interfere what you do or do in private or on private property. But I think when it when it happens in public, I think we should have some set of rules. And also li uh, libertarians, they, they don't seem to get that. Like they always think, oh, what's the big deal about, you know, nudity and sex in public? Like they're just totally in detached from ordinary people who don't want to see that in public. Yeah, many of, many of them themselves possess lots of you know, degenerate ideas. So, you know, it's, it's, it's hard for them to understand, you know, why are you banning, you know, sex in public? Well, there's a reason. I mean, if you can't understand why sex in public is being banned, then is there even a point in arguing with you? Um, because, you know, it's, you know, th there's, there's a level of morality that I think people should understand. And if you don't understand that, then, you know, I, I just don't really see a reason. I don't really see a purpose in, you know, debating or discussing things with you in the first place. Yeah, and uh, early exposure to sexualized uh, activity to, to children, that actually does harm them, contrary to what a lot of people uh, believe, because there are cases of... Um, uh, child abuse on children from other children, child and child sexual abuse is, is on the rise because children are being exposed to sexually explicit content at a younger and younger age and are copying, you know, what they're seeing in pornography. So yes, it does, it does have a consequence on young minds uh, being, being exposed to all this sexual content. It does. And, you know, it, the, the fact that it's encouraged is making it worse. I mean, the, the, the festivals like the Mardi Gras and other gay pride parades, they actually encourage all of this. You know, you know it's, it's this new modern day trend, you know, to be different, to be unique, and, you know, to be a snowflake, really. And, you know, it's sort of encouraged upon, it's, it, it's enforced upon children and they encourage it for children. And, you know, children sort of, they, they lose their path. They, they get confused about who they are. And, you know, they just start getting all these abstract ideas about sexuality and, you know, all these you know, weird ideas. And then, you know, they end up being something that they're not meant to be. And that's one of the biggest problems we have right now. And also, it's really shocking that governments fund and endorse the Mardi Gras as well. I mean, uh, regardless of your views on LG LGBT, uh, uh, I guess, uh, ideology, I mean, it sh a government should not promote nor condemn any particular uh, lifestyle choice. I mean, they shouldn't be, you know, out there saying, oh, you know, this is this is the way to live your life. They should they should just be saying, you know, individuals uh, and communities can make up their own minds about how they how they want to live. Yeah, I mean, government definitely shouldn't be encouraging this at all. You know, um, I suppose from a libertarian perspective, they shouldn't be encouraging any lifestyle choice. But from a more, you know, from a more conservative perspective, they should be encouraging the the traditional way of life. Um, but the point here is, they shouldn't be encouraging, you know, things like gay pride parades. And the, and 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 remember, they're using taxpayer money to fund this. They're using taxpayer money to fund these festivals, you know, when most people don't even want to see their money wasted on something like this. You know, it should be at the at the at minimum, you know, at the least, at the very least, it should be privately funded, uh, completely, and it should be privately held in a private environment. That's at, at you know, at the very least, that's what we want to see. That's the solution we want to see. At the very least, I'm not funded by government. I'm not funded by taxpayer money. Yeah, and, and it's also the fa uh, all the major parties, they have a float in the parade, including the, the Liberal Party, which yeah. is unbelievable. And Malcolm Turnbull, although he said he was too busy to go last uh, go this year, he, he went last year. So even the, the Liberal Party is on board with all of this. It is, yeah. And that's, you know, that's one reason why Cory Bernardi left, isn't it? Because the Liberal Party is, contrary to some people's opinion, the Liberal Party is shifting towards the left, you know, accepting all these things it shouldn't accept, you know. The, the fact that the Liberal Party had a plebiscite or was proposing a plebiscite is enough reason for people to believe that it's shifting to the right for some reason. But the thing is, 
the truth is the fact that the Liberal Party is embracing all these things is enough evidence to show that it's shift, shifting to the left. And that's going to result in its ultimate downfall because it's lost its way. Uh, uh, hopefully it'll be over my dead body if we ever saw a One Nation or Australian yes. Conservative slide. I mean, oh. Yes. <laughs> well, James Ashby might want to. Who knows? Yeah. Uh, and another concerning thing about, look, if you look at the, the float list, is the amount of youth groups and uh, education-based groups that are involved. I mean, these are the people teaching our children, and yet they're promoting this ideology. Yeah, education groups as youth groups, along with large companies, let's remember that as well. You know, large companies are very influential as well. Um, you know, Qantas had their rainbow plane. Uh, uh, you know. Holden, their car. Yes. Yes, Holden, you know, uh, people who shouldn't even have anything to do with this, you there, know. There was even a gay beer. It was hard, yeah. I believe it. I yeah, I, I, I think it was, yeah. Nobody would be, be buying that now. No, no, exactly, exactly. I mean, if I, correct me if I'm wrong, but you know, I'm pretty sure the demographic that actually uses beer wouldn't support things like this, you know, I'm assuming, you know, that's, that's what I'm assuming. Um, so, you know... That's a big problem, yes. You know, as I said, child groups, youth groups, they're supporting things like this. And it's, it's, it's sending the wrong message, you know. The wrong message is being sent by everybody. We had just yesterday, we had um, Justin Timberlake saying, be different. That's like the foundation for all this we are seeing today, you know, being different, being unique. And all these education groups, youth groups are spreading this wrong message. And it, as a result, confusing our children. Uh, now, part of the article that people are especially triggered by is said that uh, a lot of this uh, difficulty with uh, being LGBT could be avoided if they didn't choose to be that way. Uh, now, that, uh, that was, a lot of people were uh, triggered by that. They were, um, you know, that was, you know, uh, it, that was uh, meant to be an opinion piece after all. So, you know, it's not meant to be, you know, it's an opinion piece. They did say that. Um, now, I understand. It, it doesn't really, I don't think, it doesn't matter what you think about it ultimately. You know, it doesn't matter if you think it's a choice. It doesn't matter if you think it's not a choice. You know, gay people will exist. That's how it is. You know, I think it's, I think uh, it's sort of doesn't really, it's not appropriate to you know, talk about that, talk about that much because you know it doesn't matter ultimately you know if it, if you think it's a choice or it's not a choice um what matters is you know what matters is the perspective from the the traditional conservative viewpoint that says you know that maybe if they didn't choose to be gay then they wouldn't want to have this in the first place um again it's a very controversial topic yeah like i don't uh, i don't believe that same-sex attraction itself is uh, is a choice, but I definitely think, you know, acting on it and living the gay lifestyle, that, you know, is a choice because it's a choice about how you deal with it. Yeah, many people who, who are saying, you know, it's a choice aren't really saying that the same-sex attraction is a choice. Many of them are saying that exclusive attraction to the same-sex is the is the choice. You know, that's, that's the sort of... Um, you know, that's that's the. Or well, deciding uh, that I you're that it's, only going to be with uh, people of the same sex is the choice. Yeah, well, I, well, what I'm saying is, from the traditional perspective, you know, the from from that perspective, people believe that the actual sexuality where you are so what they believe is homosexuality which is exclusive attraction to same sex is a choice so that's what they're saying you know, the actual sexuality the actual attraction that's what they're saying could be wrong could be right who knows as i said ultimately it doesn't really matter it's not you know just because you you know just because you believe it's a choice or not it's not gonna, it's not really going to change anything ultimately um regarding the existence of um gay people i suppose what matters are, you know, how far it goes into politics and how far it goes into the government and its legislation. Yeah. And of course, uh, you know, uh, it, it would be good if we were able to, you know, discuss these uh, issues maturely and respectfully. But of course, the debate is so t toxic that uh, any discussion of whether uh, being gay is a choice is triggering for people and, you know, uh, hate speech, homophobia. So who knows, we'll probably get some angry people uh, responding to this podcast. 
as we had in the article for that particular section. I mean, most people did agree. Um, one of our other editors said that most people actually agree with that part, that, you know, it is a choice. Um, so he said we shouldn't really worry about, you know, triggering many people because, you know, apparently most people do are on our side on that. Um, but yeah, you know, again, as, as I said, you know, ultimately what matters is, you know, how far homosexuality and, you know, the LGBT agenda is taken into politics, really. Mm. Yeah, so if you're triggered, then good. <laughs> <laughs> so we'll move on to our Western Australian election preview. Now, we've all been busy researching uh, Western Australian politics the, the past week, so we can be informed for the live stream this weekend. Yeah, um... Please tune into that because, you know, we have, I think we are giving a much better analysis than, you know, what the mainstream media is giving. Uh, so it's uh, the current uh, Premier, Colin Barnett, he's been in power for eight and a half years. He's from the, the Liberal Party, he governs in a coalition with the National Party, but the Liberals and Nationals in Western Australia don't have a formal coalition agreement, so it's a bit different over there. So he's up against Mark McGowan from the Labor Party. Uh, now, the Labor Party has been consistently leading in, in most of the polls up to Election Day. Now, uh, Western Australia was considered uh, Liberal Party heartland, given that in the last state election, uh, the Liberals won by a landslide, and uh, at the federal level, Labor's uh, done terribly in Western Australia in every election since 2007 because uh, uh, back in 2013 it was the middle of the, the mining boom and that's when Julie Gillard was, uh, had her carbon and mining taxes which were deeply unpopular in Western Australia. So there was this real anti-Labor uh, anger at the, um, at, at the Labor Party at that time. This, um, this 2013 election was before uh, the Rudd Gillard government got turfed out. But the tables have turned now because the mining boom's over. The, the coalition government's uh, budget has gone into deficit and people think that um, you know, they're, they're not doing a good job. So it's really been a remarkable turnaround and people are now thinking that Labor is uh, the best choice. They are. And, you know, these radical changes in the economy are, I suppose, the ultimate factor. Because as you said, there was the mining boom and now the country is shifting towards a more services-based uh, focus um, with the expansion of the services sector. Um, but, you know, the polls do say that uh, Labour might win. There are some who say that it's more neck and neck, that it's more 50-50. Um, it is very hard to say because the Liberal Party does have um, a sound economic plan and this election does seem to be based on, you know, the, eco the economic differences um, mainly. Um, and of course, you know, we do have minor parties like One Nation entering, entering the arena as well. Um, so, you know, I suppose whichever party has the best economic outlook, the best economic plan, is sure to win, but again, that depends on whose side you're on, really. I mean, the Liberals have messed up the, the budget situation. Uh, their excuse is that the, uh, the GST uh, distribution for Western Australia is now down to 30 cents and a dollar. So they're saying if it was more fair, then we'd be in a, in a budget surplus. But that's, uh, that excuse doesn't seem to be washing with voters anymore. So obviously, yeah. uh, the, the, the Liberals or the Coalition haven't done uh, as good a job as we would expect of them. But is Labor really any better? I mean, Western Australian Labor Party, they're not as far left as the, the Labor Party and the rest of the country. I mean, they've got some common sense. They don't support a renewable energy target, which is refreshing. Yeah, um, which is why ultimately, you know, the Liberal Party in comparison to the Labor Party does seem to have a sound economic plan. I mean, yes, their history, their past may not have been very good. It was turbulent, but in terms of the actual plans, it does make it look like a much better alternative to, to Labor. Um, because ultimately, you know, Labor is to Labor. You know, there yeah. are other things. There, there are other things that influence this election as well. 
as such, such as their support for safe schools, for example. Uh, and, and I don't get uh, by this argument that the it's time factor that Barnett's been there for eight and a half years. It's time to give the other mob a go because in two thousand and seven, in oh, federal politics, that was the attitude to John Howard. People thought, well, he's been he's been there, you know, too long. Um, you know, Kevin Rudd seems, you know, like a good option. Let's, you know. Uh, let him have a go. And of course, we know what happened under Kevin Rudd and Julia Gillard. They plunged their the budget into deficits, spent like there was no tomorrow, you know, introduced the, the carbon and mining tax, and we're still living with the consequences today. So, you know, be careful what you wish for. Don't vote for change for change's sake. Exactly. That's, yeah, that's a very good point because, you know, the left always uses this, it's time rhetoric, you know, it's time for a change, it's time, they've been there for a while, give us a chance, you know, just like Hillary Clinton, you know, they've all had men, you know, it's time for a woman to come because, you know, it's a, it's a change, it's a progressive change. No, it doesn't work like that, okay, because it doesn't matter if it's a change, okay, because let's remember, okay, I mean, history is there for a reason, the, 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 the subject of history is there for a reason, you learn from the past, and the past has shown us that when people in the country federally voted for the, the Labour Party um, in, in, and voted for Karen Rod, what happened, what happened was, you know, the, the economy got worse, okay, the budget got worse, okay? and now we have we are billions of dollars in debt. Um, you know, we're practically a vassal state to other countries, if you, if you look at it. And so, you know, again, be careful what you wish for, because, you know, Labour might say it's a, it's, it's a change. Well, you know, let's hope it's a good change. Yeah, I, I wouldn't trust anything uh, Mark McGowan or WA Labour says. I mean, yes, of yeah. course, he's being very conservative now, but once he wins, he, he, he might do anything. He might, yeah, exactly. As, as we said, Labour is it's the same old Labour, you know, they just want to keep spending, the left, they want to keep spending. However, I do want to mention that the Liberal Party does have some um, plans to spend money that I don't agree with. Um, for example, they have a, um, they're going to increase the first home buyers grant from $5,000 to $15,000, so they're going to triple it. And I think that's a bit too much, okay, yeah. because even that is government spending. I mean, they're, they're saying it will stimulate the economy, but still, it's still government spending. How are you going to pay it, pay it back? You know, who, where does the money come from? Yeah, and we, uh, we should also um, uh, point out, if you've watched the, the Western Australian leaders, de leaders debate, uh, it's all about delivery of services. I mean, the Liberals talk about, you know, how we're going to, you know, better deliver public services. It's not real. There's not really much small government ideology with them. It's still very much about, you know, who's going to be the better economic manager. Yeah, I mean, again, I think because it's back to basics, I think, you know, who, whoever has the best economic plan will win. I, I don't think people are really interested in, you know, other more uh, sort of specific things like, you know, small government, etc. You know, what they want is, you know, some sort of common sense. You know, what they want is some sort of, you know, something that will make sure that their state will ultimately you know, handle this, you know, this, this period, this economic, this turbulent economic pre period well, and they will vote for whoever who will give them that. Um, again, you know, we, it's, it's unsure because we do, as I said, we do have one nation in Western Australia as well. And they, they are bringing something that, you know, they haven't seen for forever, really. Yeah. Um, yeah, well, yeah. let's talk about One Nation now, because uh, Western Australia has an upper house as well. So they, that has 36 members. It's, it's six, uh, six member uh, upper house regions. So it works pretty similar to how the uh, federal Senate works. So um, each uh, member of the upper house is elected for a four year term and they still use in Western Australia group voting tickets where all the other minor and micro parties can preference each other before the majors, and therefore uh, there's a greater chance for, for one of them being elected. So we could see not just one nation. Uh, I'm pretty confident they'll win at least three upper house seats, but we could see some of the other minor and micro parties um, winning, winning a few seats. We could. One Nation does seem to have lots of candidates. Um, we're just unsure whether uh, One Nation can sort of appeal to Western Australia because Western Australia is a very different state. It's not Queensland. It's a very different state with a different history, with a different, you know, um, reliance on a different sort of economic... Um, uh, but they're... they're... One, uh, Western Australia has always been One Nation's um, second, 
uh, second most supportive state. I mean, back in the 2001 state election, One Nation won three upper house seats and they won uh, a Senate seat in the last federal election from Western Australia. So they're both, both Queensland and West, Western Australia are reasonably conservative states, which is why uh, there, there is a great appeal for, uh, to, oh, from One Nation uh, in that state. There is, but back then, you know, the economic circumstances were much different. You know, now it's, they, they've been in a mining boom and now it's no longer there. So, you know, right now, Western Australia is a very different place. Um, you know, and the, the question ultimately rests on whether one nation is able to appeal to these new sort of radical or changes that Western Australia has faced. You know, are they able to better respond to this new situation that they're in? Hopefully they are. Because, you know, I suppose if, we, if they still had a mining boom, then one nation could use its, you know, good, well, its persuasive economic rhetoric. Um, well, in Western Australia, but it's, it's a different story now. Um, however, you can say that since they are disillusioned by recent events, they may switch to one nation instead, who might bring them something different, um, as opposed to, the, you know, what they've had for decades. So I suppose you do have you know, both sides have good arguments regarding whether one nation will do good or will do bad. Um, we just have to wait and see ultimately. Yeah, well, one nation is polling in between eight and fifteen percent, so which is which is pretty highly. So I, I'm pretty confident that they'll get uh, uh, get. Yeah, at least three, as I said before, and that's even after there's been a relentless uh, campaign against uh, them and Pauline Hanson by the mainstream media and also the establishment politicians, uh, even from the coalition. This whole, you know, attack because uh, started on Sunday when she appeared on Insiders, where she has expressed her admiration for Vladimir Putin's style of leadership and also uh, expressed concerns about uh, the federal government's uh, no jab, uh, no, uh, no pay policy in regard to vaccinations. Now we can sort of debate her views on on those issues, but the reality is that there there is still a lot of people who would like those views. And then uh, the next night she went on A Current Affair and she was asked by Tracy Grimshaw whether there were uh, good, uh, some good Muslims. And she made the point that, you know, if you if you had like a lineup of Muslims, how do you know which is, one is the good one, which is a fair point. But if you listen to the, the mainstream media on on the Monday and the Tuesday, they, they all said, oh, you know, she's totally finished, she's off the planet, like, oh, what a joke she is. That's why I was, uh, if you look at my most recent article on the, Ashac on the Unshackled, like pointing out that the, the, me the media and the politicians are really going after her because, uh, because yes, uh, Malcolm Turnbull, Scott Morrison, uh, Barnaby Joyce, they, they all came out and uh, attacked Pauline's uh, policies. Uh, in my article, I stated that, no, th this media narrative is totally incorrect. She's still got heaps of support. Uh, the silent majority are, st are still with her. And you guys are just, all, all you're doing is just making her stronger. Exactly. You know, you know what? The thing is, they're going off on about her in such a pathetic way. I mean, it's, it's amusing, isn't it? I mean, she said, what she said was like, the best thing you can say. Like, that's common sense. That, that's what we want to see. The, the, sense. the which comment? With um with is with the Muslims yeah. first of all um all all the comments with the Muslims first of all she said you know um if they were lining up you can't tell you can't tell whether that's that's why Trump was voted hello you know, you can't tell whether they're good or bad Muslims that's why you need, that's one reason to ban them second she said you know vaccinations again she never said you know she didn't go off about she what she said was you know there are there, there are possibilities that vaccinations can be harmful that's what she said you know and, and then people were just like you know pauline shouldn't go into medical stuff she wasn't going into medical stuff exactly she what, what she was well, saying well, was well, in her defense she did say that parents should find out the information for themselves so she didn't come out against vaccines completely yeah, she just said yeah. it should be up for the parents but of course like the the vaccine debate is one where you know bo both sides are equally hysterical so it's very hard to have like a a reasonable converse conversation on it it is yeah but the point is you know ultimately she didn't she didn't really you know make up things about it what she said was you know what she was what she said was you know 
it can be harmful, you know, it, 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 she doesn't trust vaccination. That's what she ultimately said, and many people agree with her. Um, you know, and the thing is, the, the reaction to that by the media was not justified because she wasn't, you know, she wasn't going off saying crazy things. She wasn't. She was just saying simple things that you hear every day by, by people who agree with her. And not just people who agree with her, but many people in general who don't like vaccinations, who don't trust them. You know, so the media's um, sort of reaction to Pauline's comments are highly unjustified because Pauline's comments weren't even controversial, but we all know, they probably know that, you know, we all know that they're doing this to destroy her, but I mean, they're helping her. So Yeah, yeah they, they, they still don't get it. I mean, they tried yeah. this uh, 20 years ago when Pauline Hanson first arrived on the political scene by, you know, ridiculing her and, you know, rubbishing her supporters, yet, you know, she, she's come back again, and the same thing happened with, with Trump. I mean, uh, he, he was criticised in, incredibly by the mainstream media, yet he, he, still, he still managed to have the support of the people. Exactly, because, you know, first of all, he wasn't saying crazy things. Second, he was saying things that actually made sense. He's just like Pauline Hanson is doing. Um, but the media still doesn't get that. Uh, it's their downfall, it doesn't matter. You know, no one cares about them anymore. Um, we, people only watch the media because there's nothing else to watch, really. Not because they support them. The media thinks that they have all these views, all these ratings, because people support them, people are on their side. No, that's not true. People watch your channel because there's nothing else to do. I mean, you're the only option there is, really. Yeah, and also based on the reaction to my article online, I mean, uh, there was so much support for Pauline, like saying, you know, we're, we're behind you, Pauline. So even though the, the media was saying, oh, what a terrible week she'd had, the, the support is rock solid behind her. Yeah, and that just goes to show that the mainstream media and the politicians, they are out of touch with the most of the public. That's yeah. what it ultimately shows. And even though there have been some issues with candidates uh, uh, for One Nation in, in this election, I mean, some have said some strange things, some have refused to toe the party line on preferences. I mean, altogether, it's been a, a very well run One Nation campaign, I think. It has been, yeah. I think it's been a very well run and you know I just hope it works I just hope it you know it reaps the benefits ultimately uh, and the other uh, the minor parties that are in with a chance of getting an upper house seat the the Liberal Democrats they, they could get a chance uh, a chance at having a seat in the the agricultural region Australian Christians could win one in the southern metropolitan region I believe and uh, at 2013 the shooters fishers and farmers party they won an uh, an upper house seat and they also gained a defector from the liberal party so their numbers are at two so don't forget about the the other minor parties they're all they're, they're all still still in with a good chance as well they are and they do have their own plans they do have their own um you know uh, policies and stances as well you know just the thing is many people might not know you know what those stances are really and we're hoping to get a representative from each of the, the minor parties for our election coverage on Saturday night. We've got one so far. We're hoping to get a, get a few more because, of course, we want to uh, give a fair amount of coverage to the minor parties because you know, we're definitely yeah. of the attitude that, or well, based on how the Liberal parties treated One Nation voters this week, I mean, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm certainly still not impressed with what, uh, yeah. how they're going. Yeah, they they betrayed their own uh, voters. You know, they they've. I don't think many of them support them at all much, um, because you know other minor parties are giving them a good alternative, um, an, an alternative to both Labour and Liberals. So I think you know Liberals are just digging up their own grave. Yeah. And so we're definitely hoping for a strong minor party result on Saturday night. Yes, we, we want the, the Liberal government to, to yes. get re-elected, but only because yes. they are the, the least worst option and yeah. Labour, Labour would be a total disaster. Yeah, they will be really bad. I mean, you can't trust them. You don't know what they're going to do. They're all about spending money and Western Australia can't afford that. Um, however, one thing that they do seem to have, have an advantage over is their prioritisation of um, Australia. Um, Western was a Western power, I, yes. I, I believe. It was, yeah. So you know, um, that's one thing. I, I'm pretty sure Pauline Hanson would also oppose. Um, yeah, she's selling it to foreigners. Yeah, especially to foreigners as well. But the um, liberals have said, you know what? You know, they're not going to sell it to foreigners. It's only going to be sold to domestically as an IPO um, to the public. Um, 
but you know that's one major aspect that does um, seem to have lots of debate. However, the liberal, I think their plan is good because what they're saying is, you know, we will raise eleven billion dollars through this new plan, and we will use that to pay the eight billion dollars of debt we owe to the treasury, the federal treasury, and we will use one billion for education and TAFE and one billion for roads and other infrastructure and 150 million for better energy services. Well, privatisation, it's always a difficult uh, sell in Australia because the, the public are always quite sceptical of it. It was uh, successfully, uh, uh, the Liberals in New South Wales successfully yeah. ran on electricity privatisation, but that was yeah. when Mike Baird and his Liberal government were in a much stronger position, while Colin Barnett is coming from a much weaker position. I mean, he's behind, yeah. and so there's there's not really this... Uh, goodwill towards him that even if people might have reservations about privatization they'll still vote for him anyway so that, that that's the problem yeah that's that's what saved mike in right here in new south wales because you know many people didn't like it but you know overall he was giving a very good alternative a, a very good you know, that, alternative that, labor that was back when he was popular mike bad yeah that was you know before he did start his you know uh, Greyhound racing vans, etc., and lockout laws, etc. But you know, it did give him a good advantage because overall, many people did support him because he was he was saying, you know, we will use the money to fund you know all these infrastructure yeah. projects. You know, um, Sydney right now is has the Australia's largest infrastructure project thanks to privatization of electricity. Um, so you know that that went down well with the voters because he was promising lots of things. Um, in Western Australia, you know, it's it's done to a much smaller scale. As I said, it's only eleven billion dollars they'll raise. Um, and eight billion of that, eight billion of that will go towards, you know, the debt. In New South Wales, it was a different story. You know, it wasn't didn't go towards some debt really. It went towards more practical um, material things instead of you know paying back debt so it's a different there are different circumstances so you know it's hard to compare new south wales's um or the liberal party in new south wales victory to the liberal party in western australia yeah so it's certainly going to be an interesting and important night in australian politics so we are certainly looking forward to it but that's about all the time we we've, we've got for the show today so thank you for being my co-host today again sugath that's okay it's my pleasure and a reminder to all of our listeners, if you want to be notified of when the, the live stream will be broadcast, it will be on both Facebook and YouTube. So make sure that you are already a fan of us on Facebook and subscribe to our YouTube channel. And also, uh, if you can confirm your attendance uh, via the Facebook event page, so you can be notified of any updates uh, to our coverage in the coming days. So I'll provide a link to all of those in the description. Another reminder that we're hosting the first ever Unshackled event, which is happening in Melbourne uh, next week. It's a lunch with myself, and I'll be joined by psychiatrist and media commentator, Dr. Tanvir Ahmed, who is the author of the recently published book, uh, Fragile Nation, Vulnerability, Re Resilience and Victimhood, which is published by Conacourt Publishing. So the event is on Wednesday, the 15th of March at 12.30 p.m. to 3.30 p.m. at Il Gambero in Carlton. So tickets are available from Eventbrite for $5, and I'll provide a link to uh, the Eventbrite page in the description as well. Of course, uh, the usual uh, announcements at the end of the podcast. Don't forget, if you haven't signed up to our email list yet, please do so at theunshackled.net slash subscribe. Also, don't forget to consider supporting the website. You can become a patron via Patreon or donate via PayPal. And of course, don't forget to subscribe to this podcast either on SoundCloud, iTunes, Stitcher, uh, TuneIn Radio, or view the video version on YouTube. And of course, don't forget to keep checking out theunshackled.net on a regular basis for all the latest news. And thanks once again for listening, and we'll see you next time. Thank you. Thank you.